Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next uh, EDW session called "How to Data Catalog Forms the How a Data Catalog Forms the Foundation for Data Governance," which will be presented by Kim Weinzerl, the Chief Data Officer, and Amber O'Connell, the Director of Data Governance, both with the State of, Louisiana, of Tennessee. All audience members are muted during these sessions, so please submit your questions in the Q&A on the right side of the screen, and our speakers will respond to as many questions as possible at the end of the talk. Please note that there's a linked form at the bottom of the page titled EDW Conference Session Survey. This is where you can submit session feedback and we encourage you to do so. So let's begin our presentation now. Thank you and welcome Kim and Amber. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for the opportunity to um, present this to you today. Uh, again, my name's Kim Weinzerl. I'm the Chief Data Officer for the State of Tennessee. And with me today, I have Amber, Amber? Hi, I'm Amber O'Connell. I'm the Director of Data Governance, also for the State of Tennessee. So today we are going to talk about how Data Catalog forms the foundation for data governance. Um, a little bit about our business here. Uh, we are the State of Tennessee, 36th largest state. As you can see here, there's a list of 38 different agencies within the State of Tennessee. This is like having 36, 38 different um, companies or 36, 38 different uh, product lines. Um, Tennessee welcomes you. Um, our governor is uh, Mr. Bill Lee. A little bit more about Tennessee. What are we known for? The food's amazing. Nashville hot chicken, uh, smoked meat, um, uh, a number of whiskey distilleries, of course, country music, rolling hills, dirt roads. And um, as you can see, some very um, <clears throat> fine desserts you can find in Tennessee. So uh, when things open up, y'all come visit us. So what was Tennessee trying to solve when we introduced a data catalog to the state? Um, we are looking for a couple of things. Um, with data governance, we want uniformity in the process that we're doing to say that we are doing data governance. We're all doing it in a very similar way fashion or framework. And when we say <clears throat> we're doing it, you know, we are doing it completely. Uh, you know, we like everyone else, we'd like to prevent having audit findings when it comes to data quality or data um, governance type issues. And we want, we are, uh, <clears throat> have a big push on sharing data across those 38 different agencies. So in preparation for being able to do that, we need to understand what data is key or critical um, and get it into a, uh, a governance framework. And like everyone else, out for that faster, better um, data-driven decision-making. So real thing that the state employees at Tennessee are solving for is what Governor Bill Lee says, to see the needs of our neighbors around us, every single one of them, and commit to serving them. So <clears throat> how better uh, can we serve them by making better decisions that impact them? Uh, so late last year, we implemented a data governance framework. Some of you may be familiar with this uh, framework. We've spoke about it a couple times uh, uh, in different uh, forums, but we call it the eight elements of data governance. Um, and what this framework is, is uh, a methodology and some templates, um, some recommendations for how to do data governance across the entire state. Um, Chances are much of the state is already doing a lot of this informally. So this just formalizes that process a bit. And the framework is built for reuse and completeness. So if one agency says they are fully governing this set of data and another agency says they are fully governing another set of data, we know that there that is a complete process. So within this data governance framework, um, we're here to talk about how important data catalog is this. So under these eight different elements, um, really box two, box four, and box seven have uh, usages for a data catalog. Amber? So I want to talk a little bit about why the state of Tennessee came to the idea that we did need a data catalog and kind of what, what, how we got there. So when I was promoted to the data director of data governance role three years ago, I was the first to serve in that space. 
So it was a little bit of the Wild West. And between convincing people that we did, in fact, need a data governance program and actually building the program, it became really apparent that it's really hard to govern data if you don't know what data you have. We didn't have an inventory. Our data kind of looked like that picture in the slide. There were some places that had better controls and a lot of areas that didn't. You know, we, we didn't know what we had, so we had duplicate data over and over again. We've got new data on top of old data, and it's just, it's kind of a mess. We were giving different sets of people access each time we were duplicating our data. Yeah, so the first bullet point really kind of sums it up. We had a lack of visibility, availability, and accessibility of state data assets. And so what I wanted to do was inventory and catalog what data we had so we can help people discover what data is available to them also, I can really help drive that culture change across the state to be more data fluent. No pressure, right? And the second reason for a data catalog was that we didn't have enterprise standards for data management. You know, as Kim alluded to earlier, the state is comprised of dozens of agencies that each operate as individual businesses. So everything to do with data is really across the board. A few of our systems have data dictionaries. Some of them are accessible, some of them not. Even less divisions might have business terms to find, but that's definitely not the norm. And I'm not sure if you've ever tried to justify why a business needs to spend hours creating and agreeing and defining a business glossary, but it is a really, really hard sell. I wanna talk a little bit about the Department of Mental Health. They have several different divisions and they have something called subacute. What does a patient mean when it's subacute? One division would say, oh, that's somebody who was in a bed for less than five days. One division would say, oh, that's a patient that's been in a bed for less than 30 days. This is in the same department. So if you've got a department head asking, hey, how many subacute patients do we have? You would get a wildly different number depending on who you asked. And so then the head of that department just kind of throws it out the door. They stop asking, they stop believing in data, they stop trusting their own data. And then they make decisions that aren't based on data, which is the exact opposite of what we're trying to do with what we really want to do. Um, so if we have these standard definitions and agreed upon terms, it'll really help us improve our data quality and our trust in our data, like I talked about. Um, so, of course, there's always tons and tons of reasons that organizations decide to get a data catalog. These were just some of ours. So, you know, once we made that business case, yes, we need a data catalog. Yes, this is going to help us do data better in the state. You know, we went through the traditional, you know, procurement process and, and we ended up with Alation. And so we we went live with Alation, I think, mid-January. So we're about three months into our Alation journey right now. And so we've definitely got some things that we have already implemented and then some things that are on our roadmap. So I'll go into some of those now. So Kim mentioned the eight elements of data governance and what you're looking at is box four, standards and definitions. Um, so the fourth element of data governance is implementing those standards and definitions. They're the guidelines that inform how we design data solutions, interpret information, evaluate performance, and ensure quality for our data from source to consumer. So the goals of this phase of data governance are that they're documented and required for all fields in the data set and that safe sources of data are identified. Um, data definitions literally just describe the meaning of a data element in a way that is readily understood by a data consumer. To my point of subacute, in one division, the data definition was patient in bed for five days. That's a data definition, it's readily understood. I said it, you understand it, great, let's move on. Standards are documented specifications for a specific data element or sub-element. Standards are derived from data models, data schemas, naming rules, and business rules. Standards may include things like value values and acceptable ranges, like an age is probably somewhere between zero and 120, or specific formatting rules, never, ever, ever do, do free text fields, minimum data quality levels, you must have, you know, 93% of your zip codes filled out, any determined required fields, first name, last name, usually required fields. You want, you want to know what your safe sources of data are in case you've got conflicting sources. And then, of course, formulas for deriving for any derived data that you've created. If you make if you do a report once a year and one year you go back, man, how did we get there? And you do it differently. That's a problem and that's a quality issue. So standards and definitions really help us get there. And so they're usually housed in a data 
in a data dictionary, the work is typically performed by a data steward and then reviewed by the data owner. You'll note that the templates and tools section is completely taken care of by Elation. Elation holds our business glossary. Elation holds our data dictionary. You can import a data dictionary if you have one and then can export it back out of it if that's something that you need. Elation literally is a metadata repository. That's what a data catalog is. And then of course, Elation really helps us build and understand our data so we can know what our data models look like. And then Elation really helps with that pesky F name issue. So a human sees F underscore name or F dot name or straight up just F name. And the human knows, okay, yeah, that means first name. But the computer does not know that. The computer does not know that F underscore name is the same as F dot name. However, Elation knows. And Elation can make that connection for us, make it happen automatically. So while we still need standards, it kind of reduces some of our reliance on it, and it really does help. Next slide, please. So I wanted to show you actual screenshots from our Relation instance, um, and it show that we can flag for data classification and regulation. That is super duper important working in government. We have something called public data, where data is free and open to the public. We'll put it online. We'll release it. No worries. But then we also might have really, really restricted data, like HIPAA data or PII. And that's something that really needs to be controlled really, really well. Well, if you don't know what data you have and you don't have it classified, then you're really afraid to give out any data in case you've given out the wrong data. So. Elation really helps by automatically, not automatically, but it has a place where you can say, yes, this is public data, or yes, this is restricted data. Um, it puts, it, Elation does know automatically what the last update, what the top user is of certain data. We have a space for the valid values and ranges that I talked about earlier. Next slide, please. Uh, and then, of course, the glossaries. So I, I said that Elation really helped us with our business glossaries. I, I wanted to show off our privacy glossary because, honestly, I'm really proud of it. Our privacy officer was super duper excited to help fill out this privacy glossary. Um, so, so she's defined, she's created all these terms and defined them and put them in Elation. And now anybody who logs into Elation can go and see, okay, these are all, these are what the privacy regulations are. This is what they look like. This is the official definition. Um, so, of course, you still need to do the work of defining and agreeing on terms, but it's super helpful to see what's already been done and then copy it due to peer pressure. Like, what if mental health defined a term and then the Department of Health looked at that and said, hey, that's what we do. Let's just let's just take that. And then once health did it, maybe TenCare did it. Well, now you've got an enterprise standard that I didn't even have to talk to them about. They copied it themselves. They said, OK, great. Now that's done. Box checked. Tick. Easy. So that's what's really, really great about Elation and glossaries. Uh, next, I'm gonna talk about audits. Uh, so the final element of data governance is audits. And this is a little bit unique to our data governance framework because I've never seen audit happen in any other data governance framework. And it's super important that the process is self auditable as well as prepared for external audit. And the process behind the eight elements of data governance will everything will be fully documented in one place. I like to think about it like a big three ring binder. Everything that we've done, the organization that we define, the policies we define, the procedures we've written, the definitions and standards we just talked about, all of that stuff, you're pulling it all together and maybe you're putting it in a big three ring binder. In real life, you're probably not. It's probably online in your computer somewhere, but think about the binder. And so the purpose of the internal audit is to set up a regularly scheduled audit that every data governance process is being used, policies are being enforced, and that data quality metrics are being used towards impactful action. Because if you're measuring it and you're not doing anything, why are you bothering to measure it? And so, of course, the goals of this phase include actually working through a self-audit process. You want to document any gaps in your data governance process. This is really good. That way you know, OK, this is a problem. Let's address it now. And then you want to report back on the results. So typically, the data owner determines what needs to be audited and what that schedule should be. And they're the ones actually responsible for performing that audit and then re reporting back. I find this is super helpful because it can remove that curtain that data owners to feel more knowledgeable and feel like they have ownership over that data process. They feel more trust about it and are better able to enable sharing either within or outside of their organization. 
So elation absolutely helps us with our audits. Next slide, please. Um, it's really a big piece of that giant data governance binder that I talked about. So you can see here a little bit of our self audit checklist and really elation helps with all of that. It's gonna hold our policies and our procedures, our standards, our definitions, our data flow diagrams through the lineage. All of our data is classified, like I talked about, our owners and stewards are identified and they're, they're written down in, in elation. And then I really wanted to point out who has access. Who has access to your data can sometimes be a tricky thing to answer and it's a little embarrassing, but in Alation it's super duper easy because Alation, this is a screenshot of our groups in Alation. So you've got the different groups, you've got the people who are in those groups. And then, so that's the standard Alation groups at the top. And at the bottom, you've got the custom groups. And so you can see, okay, these are the DHS sources. These are the people that have access to the DHS data. This is the TDOC sources. These are the people that have access to the TDOC data. Super easy, super easy to screenshot. If it was in a binder, I would take the page out and hand it to my auditor and say, okay, done, box ticked. And then the last, the last element of data governance I wanted to talk about was policies. Uh, Policies are the second element of data governance. And this is something that's upcoming on our roadmap. We don't quite have our policies in elation yet, but we want to. Um, so policies are gonna be the foundation of any data governance program. And the goal of a data policy is to provide guidance on how we manage a data asset over the entire life cycle. Uh, some inputs to consider for your policy are going to be terms and definitions, if you already have them, data naming standards, business rules, quality standards, and of course, information security concerns. You're going to have different level of policy depending on the different types of data that you have. And so a data policy may also authorize and define the data governance program, committees, and any roles associated with data. So you may if you remember, the whole framework started with element one, that was organization and people, and then policies is number two. So element one is where you identify your people, you identify what your organization structure looks like, and then you're going to write it down in your policy, and you're going to make sure that that's approved throughout your whole organization. Because you can't really do much else unless you have those two things in place first. And so there are five key focus areas for data policy development that you want to make sure you're addressing authoring the when, how, and by whom data may be created, changed, or deleted, access, which people or systems are authorized to see and get the data, usage, what are the authorized uses for the data, and how are they mapped back to the authorized users, maintenance, how is the data maintained in the source systems and backed up for recovery, and then retention and storage, how long must the data be kept in what format and any defined lean times for retrieval. The level of policy definition required will vary depending upon the business value of the data and the associated risk identified by the data owner. This is where I talked about the difference between you know, public data that's got very little policy around it and maybe HIPAA data or CGIS data that has very good business value, but also has a high business risk associated to it. So you're going to make sure you have really good, well-defined policy around that stuff. So what we're trying to do, what we're going to do, what's on our roadmap, of course, is putting our data policies in Alation. That way we can link it directly. If this is, this is public data, we're gonna link our public data policy. If this is CGIS data, we're gonna link our CGIS data policy. Or different departments each have their own data policy. Agriculture data gonna be linked to their policy. Uh, mental health data gonna be linked to their data policy. And that's really what we're trying to get to, but I don't have screenshots because like I said, we haven't done it yet. Next slide. Okay, back to me. So like Amber said, we're, we're fairly new at this, um, although we feel like we've got a pretty solid plan. Uh, we do have a number of agencies lining up wanting to uh, participate. They've you know, seen the value um, and they're ready to go. So this uh, chart, which I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but this chart on the left um, is talking about the data initiative uh, status uh, since we've uh, started doing some new things, uh, you know, new technologies, new techniques with data management across the state. So um, the rows are actually the agencies um, or groupings of agencies that have signed up. And then numbers one through five is kind of talking about the status or the stage they are in, whether they're, you know, just reviewing, uh, you know, these solutions um, are they actually planning for it or are they actually deploying or 
deployed. So the first column is the data governance framework. That is the eight elements of data governance. The second column is the Alation data catalog. So these are the agencies that are either planning or in or in process. Um, and then the third thing that um, we also have available now across the state is a data lake. Uh, we purchased Snowflake um, and we were very delighted to learn that you can plug Alation right into Snowflake and catalog it as well. Um, one of the main reasons we want to be able to do that is um, I have built data lakes in the past and it doesn't take very long for them to turn into a data swamp. Um, if you don't know who the owners are, <laughs> what the purpose of the data is or exactly what you have in there. So uh, we are going to have a lightweight data governance process um, running against everything that is in Snowflake and it will all be documented in the Alation data catalog. Um, so that's it. Um, what we covered today was the high level eight elements of data governance that the state of Tennessee is um, currently deploying and has adopted. Uh, we talked about how Alation uh, data catalog plays a big part in that. Um, we've talked about, um, you know, how the data lake connects uh, in with the data catalog as well. Um, future items that are coming, uh, will be coming into the catalog are going to be things uh, like reference data. Uh, so uh, within the next 12 months, we will have a consolidation project to see if we can put some governance and catalog um, uh, that as well. So I think, uh, Jim, I think maybe we're ready for questions. Cool. So I added a couple of questions. Um, I, I know that Kim, thanks for answering some of those while we were going. Um, so the first one that we haven't answered yet is from Bill, if you can see that in the uh, little side chat. And then we also have one from Margie. Okay. So Bill is saying, what is the funding model for this investment year over year? How many staff hours will you need? Um, so the funding model is uh, an annual funding model and it's based on the types and numbers of licenses that you purchase. Um, we originally bought a one-year license or preparing a three-year license coming up. Um, as far as staff hours needed to, uh, to deploy, the deployment seemed fairly easy. Um, we did purchase the Alation uh, Quick Start or Jump Start um, services. Uh, that went pretty quick. Um, but we are in the process of hiring a data librarian. So we think it's going to take about a half an FTE um, to basically help onboard the agencies and onboard the data into that. Um, the other half of that person's time, they're going to actually own our open data portals. So the public facing data, um, which again, we're taking a look to see if we can catalog that as well. Uh, the way that we're charging back then to the agencies is if you're a viewer, um, no charge, because we want to promote people to come in and use it. Um, but if you are actually a cataloger, um, so somebody that's curating the information within there, you know, they'll just pay for their licensing. Uh, question from Margie, individual catalog per agency or a single catalog? A single catalog. So um, Alation's got a very robust um, security model. <laughs> you can basically pick and choose how much people, you know, can see like Amber showed there's groups um, so that you'll be able to, uh, you know, identify grouping the people who maybe can see everything, even a test data sample, uh, test data set or not. Um, Amber, you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, not really. Yeah, it's it's got a really robust who, who can see what data. And so we definitely have some agencies that want to keep some of their data private to just themselves. And then they're keeping some of the data open to the rest of the enterprise. But we're, we're trying to encourage as much data across the enterprise as can be seen. Um, Amber, you want to take the next question from Dominic? Yep. Uh, why did you choose Alation over the competition and which other vendors did you consider? Um, so we, this was like pre-COVID that we did this uh, little 
little procurement process. Um, I don't remember what exactly the criteria was, but we needed something that would work as automatically as possible, <laughs> which is the word that, that people like to bandy about. Um, so Alation really, really is good at that. The two other top competitors we looked at were Calibra and Informatica. I don't remember the exact name of their tool, but but those those two were also top, top three as well. Question from John, how have you ensured adoption of the catalog? How do you make sure analysts and data engineers or developers are using it? Um, right now, you know, we, we put a change management plan around it. So, you know, we had a little internal marketing, uh, you know, uh, campaign going on, like, you're going to love this. You're, you know, can't wait to see this um, type of thing. And we've done a lot of uh, demos and, and examples and try to help it resonate with the, uh, with each of the agencies, but the state of Tennessee, like the agencies are starving for this. Uh, most of them have, at least the large ones have something in the way of a catalog. It's not easily searchable. Uh, it goes stagnant very quickly. Um, so they're looking to get out from under having to maintain that. And also they're very much looking forward to seeing what everybody else has. Um, so what better way than through a catalog? So I guess, uh, you know, that's, that's yet to be seen. Um, but so far, uh, great uptake uh, here at the state of Tennessee. Question from Seth. Do you have anything else interesting to share about your open uh, public data initiatives? Yeah, we're getting ready to publish one. And uh, once we publish it, um, we will have our first ever um, kind of data management, uh, you know, tn.gov uh, website, uh, which is going to help people maneuver um, through and get to open data. Um, some innovative things we'd like to do with that is, you know, be able to even share with municipalities, um, share with the federal government, um, and potentially maybe catalog uh, the data as well. Question from Brian, are you able to track viewing metrics for your glossary entries? Amber? Yes, yes you can. Uh, Lation's got some definitely built-in reports and then if those don't meet your needs, you can get your, your whatever your local Alation admin is to create your reports or honestly Alation probably would as well, but the answer is yes. I'll let you take the next one from a different Kim. <laughs> Uh, are you using tools for lineage? And if so, what tool? We are not. We are using the, the whatever lineage comes available in Alation. So far, it's not. It is there. It's not as robust as, you know, some other specific data lineage tools. But considering it's all rolled in one, it, it meets our needs for now. How about Can Melinda? Some of the automagical functions of Alation. <laughs> so I love this because when you connect Alation to your data source, you it just... It just works. You just you see the data, you see the schema, you see the table names, you see the column names, and then you can see the data. And then you can press the search bar and you've got Google for your data. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm really excited about our relation instance because when we first connected it, we connected the Department of Agriculture. And I was like, okay, let's, you know, this, this is before we had even done any curation, any, any, any input. I was like, cool, this is great. Now I'm going to search for county data. We had 606 no, 763 tables that had county data in it. And Alation knew that immediately. The search happened and there it was. There's all my there's my 763 tables with, with county data. So that's what I think of when I think of Automagical. Uh, next questions from Andrew. Any thoughts on how best to create, gather, review, approve content included in the data catalog? Um, yeah, use the eight elements of data governance because that's what that framework tells you. It gives behind that framework, there is a uh, guidebook and a couple playbooks that pretty much, um, you know, you take that, you modify it to what you need to get done um, and it steps you through the processing. So that's how we've uh, chosen to do it at the state. Question from Don, does your state have any data privacy regulations in the hopper and how might you work with this? Yeah, so data privacy, as you might imagine, is huge um, um, for a government entity because you know, last thing you want to do is uh, release uh, information about your citizens into the wrong hands. So, um, you know, there's a lot of data privacy um, regulations, laws that we already work under, um, but we are 
um, looking at those and making sure we stay within those guidelines as we start offering up data sharing. So I think we're out of time, but gosh, great questions. Thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah, we are out of time. Um, there was another question that came in that we're not going to have time for, but um, uh, you'll be able to come back into the session and see that if uh, you do care to respond. Um, that being said, thank you so much uh, for this great presentation, both Amber and Kim. Uh, and thanks to our attendees for tuning in. Uh, please complete your conference session survey on uh, this page um, for this session. The next sessions will start in about 10 minutes. Please also remember to stop in at the sponsor booth before 1.30 p.m. Pacific time today. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.